very much, Misha. We're going to go on now to our last speaker. Nick Volpe is uh, is a, a, a wonderful neuroophthalmologist who is now the chair of the ophthalmology department at. Uh, Northwestern University in Chicago. He was educated on the East Coast, uh, was formerly at the University of Pennsylvania. He had originally received some training in Boston. He is really a, a master, and I am sure he will give you some very good information about giant cell arteritis. Hello. And welcome to the SOE webinar, Neuro-Ophthalmology Series. My name is Nicholas Volpe, and I'll be talking to you about giant cell arteritis from a beautiful Friday morning in Chicago. I'm excited to speak on this topic because not only will we review the classic presentations of giant cell arteritis and the importance of this diagnosis in all neuroophthalmic conditions, but also I'll have the opportunity to share some new approaches to diagnosis and of course, the new opportunities for treatment with tocilizumab. I have no financial disclosures relevant to this presentation. I receive equity ownership in a company that works with OCT, but I will not be discussing that. So first and important is to consider the context of this condition and who gets it. This condition is almost exclusively in the Northern hemisphere Populations of Anglo-Saxon origin, lighter skinned individuals are more prone to this condition. There are certain HLA types that have shown up in different populations. It may be related to where more older patients are, but there very, there very well may be an environmental factor, either related to infectious agents or possibly sunlight that contribute to the development of the disorder. And notably, the incidence is increasing. The, Exception to this, of course, uh, here's a series of patients that were reported by myself and a number of other co-authors that di identified giant cell arteritis in patients of African-American or Black descent. Interestingly, this group had a higher incidence of headache and eye pain and a lower incidence of typical draw claudication, which I'll discuss in a moment, which is one of my uh, most important predictors of patients who have temporal or giant cell arteritis. Risk factors by far the most important is older. This diagnosis is on the top of your list in any patient, uh, particularly over age 75, but even as you get older into the 80s and 90s, any type of neuroophthalmic presentation, whether it's vision loss or double vision, should have uh, temporal arteritis in the differential diagnosis. Uh, definitely the possibility that some type of triggering arterial disease, uh, there are some reports to suggest that smoking is a risk factor, that allows a potential, for instance, viral pathogen or other entity to trigger the inflammatory response in the blood vessels. Uh, one epidemiologic study showed that former pregnancy is protective. And there've been a number of interesting uh, reports and populations in which the listed entities, parvovirus, bird keeping, adenovirus, RSV, and others uh, might be risk factors for this condition. Symptoms, of course, headache. Uh, headache is an unusual symptom in an elderly patient that doesn't have headaches. So as soon as you elicit a history of headache, you have to consider temporal arteritis. Two thirds of the patients have new headaches, but accident, actually because our diagnostic threshold and our sensitivity to this condition and its unusual presentations, the actual prevalence of headaches is decreasing because people are recognizing the disorder under other circumstances. Usually the pain is in the scalp and over the temporal, artery, temporal arteries, and it could be mild or severe. Uh, occasionally it's intermittent, but most of the time it's persistent. And again, as I mentioned, draw claudication, which is not TMJ, it's not I open my mouth, it's when I chew, I progressively get more pain in my jaw, my throat, my tongue, uh, as I'm trying to eat, for instance, chewing a piece of meat. <clears throat> Importantly, uh, many and most patients, as we think about how we distinguish this from non arteritic ischemic optic neuropathy, those that develop arteritic ischemic optic neuropathy, uh, the vast majority have prodromal symptoms. Unfortunately, that majority is only 75%. And there will be 25%, which I'll talk about in a minute, of patients who really are presenting with isolated neurovisual presentations that actually have a cult giant cell with the absence of other symptoms. The classic ones, as mentioned, the headache, scalp tendon, and draw claudication, fever, weight loss, malaise, polymyalgia symptoms, muscle pain, 
those are all important systemic symptoms. And of course, anybody who has double vision for a few hours and it goes away, transient vision loss and it goes away and then goes on to develop a more uh, catastrophic event uh, with this type of ocular prodrome has giant cell until proven otherwise. About 50% of patients will present with uh, visual symptoms. Uh, the most common, of course, is vision loss in the setting of ischemic optic neuropathy, but about a third will have transient vision loss prior to developing their event. These, in my opinion, are some of the most critical patients to try to recognize in your practice that are presenting with vision that recovers uh, in the backdrop of temporal arteritis, because these patients could potentially be saved. Double vision and eye pain are other symptoms. <clears throat> in patients that we call quote, occult GCA. Again, these are patients who don't have a lot of other systemic symptoms. Uh, it can represent between 20 and 25%. Uh, the sed rate and C-reactive protein uh, are often uh, abnormal, but maybe less abnormal, again, presumably because the disease is less widespread in terms of its symptoms. Obviously, these are all visual presentations in uh, this classic paper by Hayray, uh, but you can see, again, about a third with amaurosis and 100% with some type of vision loss most commonly ischemic optic neuropathy. <clears throat> Perhaps one of the most important clues in the patients with vision loss to uh, the fact that it's arteritic or giant cell based is the fact that vision loss is almost always severe. Uh, as you can see from this bar graph, uh, 2200 and worse for the vast majority of patients. Uh, and in fact, if you have count fingers, hand motions, light perception vision in someone with ischemic optic neuropathy, that you're trying to decide whether it could be arteritic almost always favors arteritic when the vision loss is severe. Uh, remember that the vision loss can also affect the retinal circulation. And perhaps one of the more important points I'd like to make is that if you're not finding significant fundus findings, in other words, swollen optic nerve or artery occlusion, but you do have catastrophic vision loss in an elderly person, the presumption there is that this is posterior ischemic optic neuropathy and that is giant cell until proven otherwise. <clears throat> so 80%, uh, I showed a different slide a little earlier that it was about 90%. Uh, there's a combination uh, of uh, artery and, uh, I'm sorry, uh, optic nerve and retinal ischemia presentation. I'll show an example of that. That's almost always a giant cell arteritis. Of less than 10%, but a significant minority will have this posterior ischemic version. And again, a frank ocular ischemic syndrome can develop uh, in a small percentage of patients. Uh, here's a nice uh, uh, and recent uh, summary patient uh, paper about the various findings and symptoms in a cohort of giant cell arteritis patients. Um, you can uh, take a minute and look carefully at these uh, slides in terms of the prevalence of the uh, symptoms, but you can see that uh, things like uh, the new onset of headache and scalp tenderness, uh, temporal artery tenderness, those are present in a significant number of patients in the 70 to 80 percent range. Uh, in this particular series, interestingly, about 40 percent reported fever. So a fever of unknown origin in an older patient uh, is an important symptom to consider. Uh, but again, the, what I want to emphasize here is that these people generally have other symptoms in addition to their neurovisual presentation. Uh, and then in this uh, very nicely demonstrated pie chart, uh, you can see how things break out in terms of the presentations of vision loss, strongly favoring uh, anterior ischemic optic neuropathy as the most common uh, scenario. <clears throat> Certain, uh, the, in this case, unlike non arteritic ischemic optic neuropathy, where we're a little less sure uh, exactly what the mechanism is in non arteritic here, we know that we're dealing with catastrophic infarction of the posterior ciliary vessels or ophthalmic artery, leading to optic nerve ischemia. Uh, and here are some uh, nice examples of uh, ischemic optic neuropathy, very pale swelling, typical of giant cell. Here's a posterior ischemic optic neuropathy uh, with uh, a cotton wool spot. This is a classic presentation uh, for giant cell arteritis. And I'll talk about this again in a minute, but the use of fluorescent angiography to demonstrate choroidal non-perfusion can be a critical diagnostic aid in working through these patients. In my experience, uh, the giant cell arteritis examination uh, often either has this very classic presentation or sometimes there's a paucity of findings in patients with vision loss. So once again, here I show some classic examples of chalky white swelling. Here's that simultaneous ischemic optic neuropathy with branch retinal artery occlusion. Here's posterior ischemic optic neuropathy with just a cotton wool spot 
And here's a patient with just some feathery cotton wool spots and maybe a suggestion of choroidal ischemia on exam. So these were all patients that had severe vision loss in the setting of giant cell. In terms of making the diagnosis, as mentioned, the demographics, the, the older women who are lightly pigmented, that's the most common population. Remember the prodromal symptoms as listed with jaw claudication and scalp tenderness, um, the abnormal artery on exam. Remember that the most potent predictor of not having temporal arteritis is in fact the low SED rate, but unfortunately somewhere between 15 and 20% of patients with giant cell will have a normal sedimentation rate. So you don't get off the giant cell train, so to speak, or making that diagnosis just because of the SED rate. And I would urge you to think about ordering the SED rate with a pretest probability suspicion and decide what you're going to do based on the SED rate before you SED rate result before you even order it. So if it's less than 50, I'm not going to do anything. If it's between 50 and 75, I'm going to treat them and, and a biopsy. If it's 100, I'm going to admit them to the hospital. Some thinking where you're not, now what do I do? I've got the SED rate. Think about what you're expecting to do based on the test result. Um, <clears throat> so again, uh, various studies show normal SED rate in uh, up to 20% of patients. Uh, there is some indication that more SED rate elevation requires, uh, suggests more active disease. The C-reactive protein and platelet count also ordered as complementary tests and uh, helps with false positives and negative SED rate. And obviously the combination of SED rate and C-reactive protein being both elevated puts your probability in the 90% range. As mentioned and demonstrated in these photographs, this entire choroid is not perfused. This one has uh, non, uh, a lobular non-perfusion areas. I use fluorescein angiograms quite frequently in the distinction of visual presentations of temporal arteritis. Because even in some with amaurosis or just some transient visual symptoms, a paucity of findings, don't underestimate the importance of fluorescein angiogram. Uh, here's a contribution I made earlier in my career about the temporal artery biopsy. Uh, before we had alternatives, which I'm gonna talk about in just a minute, uh, the rule was everybody gets two biopsies. In my experience, uh, we do unilateral biopsies and only follow with a second when there's a high clinical suspicion and a negative on the first. We don't do simultaneous bilateral biopsies. And in fact, uh, based on some of these newer techniques, the first uh, uh, Doppler ultrasonography, which was first reported by Schmidt in the New England Journal in 1997, we are using other methods now to increase our sensitivity and uh, ideas about the screening for giant cell without having to do a biopsy. Uh, and it, it's a very quick and non-invasive test. And I believe this is the first test that should be gotten on all patients after the laboratory workup when giant cell is highly suspected. Uh, and it's a very easy finding to make as demonstrated on these slides, these hypoechoic areas uh, around the artery that are really just demonstrating the thickening and infiltrated arterial wall in patients with giant cell. And you can see in various studies when compared to uh, uh, the temporal artery biopsy as the gold standard, there's a fairly good sensitivity and specificity. It gets into the 80 or 90%. Uh, of course, nothing being 100%. The only thing that's 100% is a good doctor making good decisions based on the um, various amounts and types of information that are available to him or her at the moment. And when in doubt, we treat these patients and, and go towards biopsy. Uh, some newer techniques that have been used, uh, uh, functional uh, MRI scans with uh, tracer elements that show inflammation in the arteries, uh, some exciting uh, sense that these will be very predictive and sensitive and specific. Uh, actually, MRI scan, as seen in these uh, very elegant pictures, uh, can demonstrate uh, true inflammation enhancement of the super, superficial temporal arteries. Um, and uh, we're finding that uh, we sometimes stumble upon this when an MRI scan is done for a third nerve palsy or some other reason where the suspicion was low, uh, and we'll look for this and then decide to pursue uh, giant cell arteritis based on these findings. Uh, I think this is an excellent summary in this rheumatology article by Point uh, about the approach, and it very much mirrors my approach with the addition of using fluorescein angiography. So this is written by a rheumatologist, so they don't have a visual presentation, uh, but I think this plugs in pretty well in terms of how patients might present to me uh, with a vision loss symptom. And you can see uh, using the ultrasound uh, is, the, is the first step. And if it's negative uh, and uh, the suspicion is low, you can stop there. And then if it's higher, then you can decide on biopsy or one of these other methods. 
uh, if it's positive and high, uh, I'm done uh, because that patient, if I'm pretty sure they have it and I get the ultrasound, then I will treat this patient without a biopsy. And then if it's lower medium, again, potentially using fluorescent angiogram or the other diagnostic tests to help you make a decision. <clears throat> uh, so prompt treatment, of course, uh, anybody who you even think might have this gets treated with steroids and hydration. Uh, we use intravenous steroids when vision loss is present based on some studies that suggest that it works more effectively. I think the most important thing is that the steroids get into the patient. So if they're gonna to have to sit 12 hours in the emergency room waiting to see a nurse or a doctor to get steroids, then you're better off getting them the pills at a pharmacy. Just get steroids to these patients uh, immediately and as quick as possible, long before you make a decision as to whether they definitely have it based on your diagnostic testing. Uh, most patients require treatment for up to two years. Uh, there's a, definitely an increase in fractures and diabetes from the steroid treatment. And until recently, all the alternatives, azathioprine, cyclosporin, uh, which uh, work in some patients, but uh, no good trials had been uh, demonstrated success. <clears throat> and then finally, in the last five years, uh, with targeted treatment against IL-6, which is an inflammatory mediator that is upregulated up -regulated in inflamed arteries in giant cell patients, uh, has been studied and very effectively um, in uh, the uh, last five years demonstrated in a couple of different randomized clinical trials to be highly effective. This is tocilizumab uh, as an adjunct treatment for the, uh, the treatment of giant cell arteritis. So uh, this is now becoming standard of care. The question is how and when this care is introduced to patients. So this is not a beginning treatment. This is part of the chronic treatment and a desire to get the patients off of steroids sooner. And while as an organized community, we don't have specific recommendations, it'll depend on the rheumatologist that you work with, we are, I am finding that I'm introducing tocilizumab much sooner in the treatment of most patients. Um, there are different uh, uh, professional recommendations in different journals about uh, who should get it. And uh, the emphasis, of course, recognizing that steroids go first for sure. Uh, and you're not delaying treatment for diagnosis, and then you're introducing tocilizumab, particularly uh, in patients who you need to get off of steroids and in whom this can be done effectively uh, and expeditiously. Uh, and then another excellent uh, editorial and discussion uh, by Alfredo Sedun and Lynn Gordon, kind of going back and forth and when uh, and whether it should routinely be used. And I, I don't have an answer for you except to say that I am using it on a more and more regular basis in combination with my rheumatologist and having very much success in getting patients off of, onto lower doses of steroids at a much sooner rate. So <clears throat> with that, I thank you for your attention. Uh, remind you again that the presentation should be suspected in any patient who's over age 70, uh, less so under age 60, but as you get into 75, 85, if you have vision loss, double vision, or any neuroophthalmic presentation, you should think temporal arteritis, you should use fluorescent angiography, don't hold treatment for diagnosis. Think about introducing ultrasound and the other diagnostic methods. Thank you very much.